Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Coach. Today we welcome Reverend Emma Leva to Coffee with Coach. March is Women's History Month, so I've been talking with women pastors about things that are going on with women in ministry today. So stick around for a very interesting conversation with Emma Leva on Coffee with Coach. I have three goals for these videos, to help you become a better pastor and leader, to save you time and money, and to help educate, energize, and motivate you to energize and motivate your church. Today we welcome Reverend Emma Leva. Emma has served as a local pastor in three multicultural Hispanic churches and as an administrative assistant for the Connectional Ministries of the California Pacific Annual Conference. She has been actively involved with Marcha, the National Hispanic Plan, United Methodist Women, and Spanglish, a camping experience for young people to develop their leadership skills. Emma has also served as a spiritual director for Walk with Emmaus, Credo Recovery Communities in Southern California. She is the current lead pastor of the Montclair First United Methodist Church, Arbol de Vida, a bilingual ministry. Emma's many passions include equipping the saints, mentoring young leaders, hosting spiritual retreats, and starting new ministries. She is a graduate of Azusa Pacific University and a student at Claremont School of Theology. When not in ministry, Emma loves to spend time with her husband, Pastor Manuel Leva, and their beautiful college-aged daughters, Daniela and Olivia. One of Emma's favorite Bible verses is, With God, all things are possible because she has seen the Lord do marvelous things throughout her life. We look forward to talking with Emma and finding out about those marvelous things. Welcome, Emma Vega Leva. Yes. Married lady that you are. Um, do you have a coffee cup? Yes, I do. Let me see your coffee cup. Okay. Nothing is impossible with God. I love it. <laughs> but I see a tea uh, you, bag in there. You're drinking tea. That's fine. You know, I just had a, a big cup of coffee right before. And I, I, I'm i trying to cut down on my caffeine. Oh, good because girl. during this time, you know, we need a whole lot of Jesus and, and just some coffee too, you know, to make it through the day. <laughs> but I had my coffee this morning. So I said, Lord, what am I going to do? And I said, I... I know it's called coffee with coach, but, um, uh, you know, it's, um, it's all good. You know, some of us oh. are, are drinkers and some of us are tea drinkers. So I love both. So praise God. <laughs> there you go. Well, you'll be, you'll be happy to know that, that Bishop Olivero was drinking tea when I interviewed her last week. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so, and the coffee cup I brought this morning, um, says pastor, but it's a, a cup from Pueblo, Mexico. Well, beautiful. So, so in our, all of our um, Hispanic and Latino brothers and sisters, we salute you. Te honramos y te bendecimos en el nombre del Señor. So thank you for the blessing. <laughs> so Emma. Yes. Tell me about your ministry. Now you're in Montclair. And and you're doing our bold de vida. So what yes, is Arbol, what is what is our bold de vida? Arbol de vida is in Spanish. It's translated tree of life. Mm -hmm. Tree of life. And I think that is so uh beautiful. It reminds me of the psalmist in, in chapter one, you know, describing us that you know that that we are by those living waters and and more than ever, we need to be grounded in the word, grounded in, in his presence, grounded in and 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 his love to really be able to be nourished and strengthened um, during our during our walk with God and with one another. So it's it's I love that image and I love the symbol of us uh, being just at the right place at the right time, which is where where God is, where we can be fed, where we can be quenched of our thirst. And so that is um, our ministry called. Montclair First United Methodist Church, Arbol de Vida. Emma, what inspired you to enter the ministry? <laughs> you 
you know, when I, when I read that question, I just laughed because the truth is, is that I always purpose in my heart, never, I would never be one of those, you know, those pastors, those, those ministers. I, I, you know, there's certain vowels sometimes that we, we say to ourselves, well, we, we never really um, realize or subconsciously, like, I will never be like my mother. And then you end up being like your mother, <laughs> or I will never do that. Or, you know, and, and you, you, you know, you start saying that, but I, I, I honestly, you know, I, I, I never saw myself of being in the ministry. I was perfectly content. I'm serving God as a lay person, serving God in the business sector, you know, in the marketplace. And I was totally uh, happy and blessed and, 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 and just content really of being able to sow in the kingdom of God. So to answer your question, I never, I never was inspired to enter the ministry. I was, I was just always in the, supporting the ministry, you know, in, in one fashion or another. And uh, it was not until actually um, I attended one of our United Methodist Women's Conference events that I, I, I was able to meet uh, a reverend, an ordained elder in the Methodist Church. Her name is Reverend Gwen Ehrenberg. Mm -hmm. um, she is now a retired United Methodist elder. She was led by God to gather women in ministry. She was actually the first person who spoke into my life. And she shared with me God's heart for me. And so she happens to be the founder of Supporting Women in Ministry International. And she's the one that pointed out the gifts and graces, which I myself was not even aware of. And she just straight out told me, Emma, you're called to preach. You're called to preach. And I was shocked. I was Did you anticipate difficulty in the process of entering ministry as a woman? You know, there's, there's many layers to that. Um, and, and it's, and when, and of course you can never fully anticipate, you know, uh, what you may encounter, especially any opposition or difficulties. You know, I, I went to God, honestly, I just, I just, I was just, I just laid it all down and I said, God, if this is not from you, I'm going to crash and burn and everyone's going to see. Okay. Because I just need to know, is this really from you? Because, you know, there's, I, I believe there's three kinds of pastors. There's ones that, that God calls, there's one that the people calls, and then there's one that, that call themselves. And I said, God, I, I don't want to be one that calls themselves. I don't want to be one that, you know, that the people wanted their own King. They, they, they pick Saul, you know? And we, we saw that it didn't turn out so well, you know? And I said, I want to, if, if you're calling me, I need to make sure this is really from you. So of course, I, I wanted to make sure, God, am I really called by you? It, is, this, is this really from you? Because, you know, I, I, I was just like Moses, giving him all my excuses, all the reasons why I, I'm not qualified. You know, I'm not the right person, God. Look at, and I gave him a list. <laughs> I don't want to do my will. I want to do your will. You know, what is your will for my life? And, and, and I want to make sure that I do this for the right reasons. Uh, and so I just, I just wanted to be very careful and cautious because I've seen it from both sides. Remember I was on the outside looking in and, and I saw uh, what, how they treated pastors unfairly. I saw uh, some lay people, how they, they were just mean, you know, mean to pastors. And I said, wow, you know, um, there, there's no reverence, there's no honor. And I, and I just said, God, I, I really need to make sure this is from you, but you just have to just be um, grounded in prayer and, and asking God, what is my assignment today? See, Jesus didn't heal everybody. He didn't go everywhere. He didn't do everything. You know, it was like, he was always asking God, who is my assignment today? you know? And so that really uh, gave me a lot of peace. So even though I didn't know what to expect, I knew that I could always go to God and say, God, what do I do? What difficulty did you encounter when you actually began in ministry? And do you think that was because you're a woman, because you're a Latina, uh, or just because the churches you were serving were difficult churches? What difficulty did you encounter initially in your ministry? Well, there was, a, there was many difficulties. There was many difficulties, you know, uh, the already entering, you know, the appointments, I, I already saw 
and it was it was um, I was informed clarity in writing of of what priorities I should I should um, be focusing on because each of the churches, you know, they had they had some serious problems. They had serious financial problems, serious internal um, uh, difficulties. Uh, leadership was was sparse. Uh, resources were scarce. And basically, these were churches either that they needed to be turned around or closed down, you know, um, and it's it's many of our churches have gotten to to that crossroad, you know, say so either either we're going to die or we're going to rebirth, you know, and so the difficulty is, is that coming in uh, with with very little uh, pastoral experience behind you, you know, even though I, I've been in the ministry for many years mm-hmm. and different capacities but nothing has, has truly equipped you, you know, no seminary can prepare you, you know, no, um, no different ministry is, is really the grace of God truly. So yes, I had uh, many, many, many difficulties. I am a female and I am Latina, you know? And so one of the, one of the churches that I was appointed at was a, a traditional church. Um, if you looked at the wall, you can see every uh, pastor that has served since the beginning, you know, it's a hor- historical church. And guess what? When I looked, they were all male and they were all white. <laughs> okay. And here I am, uh, you know, first woman in that pastor and she's ethnic, she's Latina, she's a woman of color. And so some, I remember somebody said, wow, you have big shoes to fill. And I just turned to the person and I just smiled and I said, no, I don't. I have heels. I have heels. <laughs> Number four, what do you wish your male colleagues knew or understood about being a woman in ministry? You know, you know, when, when I was reading that question, I was just thinking about the relationship between Deborah and Barack. You know, if we would really understand that we couldn't do this without you, you know, even though God uh, gave Deborah um, the position, the authority, the influence to lead a nation, God gave her Barack's name, okay? And Barack was humble enough, he was secure in himself as a man of God to go under her leadership, okay? To be able to, to work together um, and to be able to co-labor and, and to be able to have victory because they were outnumbered, you know? And so, what I wish our male colleagues would, would, would know is that there's moments where we would, we would need to submit to your leadership. And then there's moments where our male colleagues is okay to submit under a woman's leadership, you know, that we can submit to each other in love for the purpose of accomplishing God's will, for the purpose of, of blessing the kingdom of God. And so I, I, I say that because, you know, there there has been moments in my in my ministry and my own uh, uh, t- experiences in the ministry, especially with our Hispanic male clergy, you know, that uh, some of them are either they they do not want to be under a woman's leadership. Uh, they do they they want to always be leading. Uh, they they do not want to co they sh- share their leadership or th- or share their power. You know, not everybody. Okay, I don't want to make a blanket statement here, but we do need to name it. We do need to name it, and 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 how we can work together, how we can um, serve together, how we can share leadership, platforms, resources, um, because not everybody has the same gifts. You know, we really are strengthened when we work together, when we combine our strength, we combine our gifts and graces. And God gets the glory, you know? Um, and so, so... So you get more flack from, more resistance from Latino pastors than you do from white pastor, white male pastors. Yes, actually, the ones that have been my greatest cheerleaders have actually been white um, pastors. You know, they, I don't know, you know, they, they you know, they... You know, there's certain things that um, that I've received from them that that I don't receive from my male colleagues at time. 
have you had encounters as a encounters as a woman in ministry that you don't think your male counterparts have had and can you share some of those yes um that is one that makes me chuckle okay <laughs> i can tell <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of the times is, is uh people are surprised you know i don't think that they um our male counterparts have this uh kinds of things that they have to experience let me give you a perfect example i just had uh, another uh, celebration of life. Uh, it was a huge um, celebration of life. I don't know how many people were there, 300, 400, okay? There was mariachis because it was a Hispanic family, okay? And all the mariachis were all male. And I was with my husband who's male and Latino, okay? Mm -hmm. And he was with me and, and, the, and, 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 and the daughter of the person that, that passed away that was deceased she was the one that is part of our congregation, okay, Joshua. Okay. And she came and she was with me because we, we had to address and give instructions to the mariachi, okay? Mm -hmm. And right away, the mariachi are looking around to see, okay, who's the pastor? I'm, I'm sure they glanced at my husband that was a Hispanic male and he happens to be a pastor. They glanced and they were looking around to say, okay, who's the pastor? Who's the one that's going to give us the instructions? And right away, Joshua, she steps in and she said, this is my pastor, Pastor Emma. <laughs> and so right away, I, I take out my hand and I, I said, Dios te bendiga, soy la pastora Emma para servirle. I shake out my hand and I say, you know, I'm, I'm Pastor Emma here to be at your service. And they're shocked. <laughs> they're shocked. And, and so uh, not everyone has had uh, experiences with a female clergy or clergy women. And so that one, I, I had to like hold it in because not because this was a solemn um, occasion, you know, you have to put on the, the pastor uh, outfit, you know, I even had my clergy collar and everything, you know, I had to be the pastor. <laughs> but it was hilarious. I, I got a kick out of it because you should have seen him. <laughs> like what? A woman pastor? <laughs> And so uh, I, I just had a chuckle. I, I have to chuckle, you know, and, and uh, I held it. And I was like, I was like, Lord, I go, Lord, let them see you, Lord. Let them not see me. Let not me be a distraction or a hindrance, but allow them to see you. You know, that is my prayer. And so, so that's something that most male pastors, you know, when, when they're, when they are in being introduced, oh, this is my pastor. Um, right away, they're, 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 they're accepted or received. And that's not something that um, I don't believe generally that they would encounter, you know, either a surprise or even rejection, because I have heard from my clergy women colleagues that as soon as the, the parishioners find out that there's a woman um, coming to serve their church, a lot of them don't even attend anymore. Because, you know, some people, it's not a Latino issue. It, it just, some people are not in agreement, you know, even in this 21st century, they don't believe a woman um, should be, uh, you know, leading a church, you know, and even though, you know, we've been, uh, you know, ordained for, for many years, there's still people across the board that are not comfortable or they've never experienced uh, being under a woman pastor. Now, do, do you feel that that's more uh, prevalent in, uh... Latina churches, uh, where you've got predominantly a Spanish-speaking congregation, do they have more resistance to a female pastor than a white congregation is going to have? Do you have any sense of that? You know, traditionally speaking, and it also it's it's also it has a correlation between which generation you're speaking to, okay. because. In the Methodist Church, we not only have a first generation Hispanic group, we have a second generation, third generation, and now fourth, even fifth generations. Okay. And so, you know, over, you know, our millennials and younger generations, they're open. They're much more open than our traditional first generation Hispanic, you know, folks. Okay. And I really believe it's because of tradition. And I believe that they just haven't seen it done. Okay. And now, you, so, mean, you mean first generation in the United States? 
in the United States. Okay, so so people who come in to the United States and the, the first generation people, they're going to have more resistance to a Latina pastor than people who've been here for five generations. Yes, that has okay. been my experience because they're just more open, and and not only that, they they haven't had the opportunity. You know, they haven't been sure. they haven't seen that. You know, they just they just haven't seen it. And so I'm really thankful for uh, the denominations as the United Methodist Church that really uh, does, they don't see gender, but they see the call. They're really discerning and really prayerful about this, you know, uh, and they really acknowledge the gifts and graces and cultivate that and have those platforms and, and spaces, sacred spaces to continue to pray and discern upon um, because that is our role it is, is to encourage and nurture uh, those that that are feeling the call, um, if it's if it's if it's a if it's a clear call, or if it's one that is stumbling like Thomas, you know, I'm not really sure, you know, uh, <laughs> but there's okay. spaces for for all of that. Have there been hurdles that you felt you had to clear that your male counterparts may not have had to? And if you think so, can you share some of those experiences? Yes, I believe as a woman we. We tend to have much more hats than the ma our male counterparts, our male colleagues. Okay. I, I myself um, am not just a pastor, but I'm a wife. I'm a mother. You know, I'm a daughter. And so, even though our male colleagues, you know, have similar different roles, but they, 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 I'm speaking in general now. They, you know, they're 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 more focused, and it's more accepted in our culture you know, for our male pastors to just focus on their vocation, to focus on, on, on their call. But you see women, you see as myself, but when you have multiple hats, you know, um, you're juggling more things, you know, and we see that, you know, even that image in the Proverbs 31 woman, you know, that uh, not to discourage a woman, but to be able to, to encourage women mm -hmm that you are multi-talented, multi-faceted, that God has um, gifted you in ways that you can be a businesswoman, that you can hone in on a skill set, that you can be a leader, that you can serve the poor, that you can, you know, uh, buy land and buy property, be a, a homeowner, that you can, you know, be able to, to, to care for your children and to prepare for the future. So, um, that is something that I definitely, um, my hat's off to many of, 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 of the women that tirelessly, sacrificially continue to, to sow love um, and care and nourishment um, to the children and to, and to their parishioners as well. So that's, that's been a hurdle to think about being all of those roles while also being a pastor. It's not a hurdle. It's just, it's, the hurdle is trying to manage it. The hurdle is trying to balance, but above yeah. all, the hurdle is making sure that you also self-care, Make because it's really easy for us to care for everyone else and you neglect yourself because we're givers, we're mothers, we're nurturers. And so the hurdle is don't forget to, to take your Sabbath. Don't forget to spend time with the Lord. Don't forget the hurdle is going to be uh, do not get distracted. The hurdle is going to be, do not, you know, be all things to everybody. You know, the hurdle is going to be, you know, it's okay to say no. You know, the hurdle is, is the temptation and the pressure to, to always have to be available or, 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 or to, or to say yes. And so those are just those, those, those everyday, um, moments that you have to choose, you know, I need to make sure that I care for myself. And I, and I, and I make sure that on a weekly basis, a regular basis that you practice your spiritual uh, practices as well, whatever it is that speaks to your soul. If it's taking a walk, if it's praying, if it's, um, you know, taking a spa day, take giving yourself permission uh, to take a day off, giving yourself permission to have a girl's day out, giving yourself permission, you know, not to be a pastor, giving yourself permission to 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 enjoy God's beauty. And so so that is a hurdle not to get so consumed and so busy that you don't have time for yourself to care for yourself.
What has been the most challenging aspect of your ministry in general? And then what's been the most challenging part of your ministry as a woman? Yes. Um, again, the challenges is, is, um, could be overwhelming as well. You know, the expectations, um, and even, even, um, verbal and unverbal, you know, there, there, cause there's some, some, some rules that are not written, right. Some protocols that sometimes you don't even know, um, uh, that exists there. And so the challenges have been to discover, you know, what are the protocols? Uh, the challenges have been, uh, what, what kinds of things can, can, can you really do in, in, in the community? You know, the challenges have been trying to find out, you know, not only what goals um, you have in mind, but you know, what, 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 it, what is God trying to do in that area? So the challenge is, 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 is always once again, uh, to find out what the priorities are uh, and, and what gifts has God given me as a, as a leader and what God has, has, has entrusted to you and to make sure that it's fruitful and that it would bless and it would transform lives. Okay. And what's the most challenging part as a woman? As a woman, you just, the challenging part is you just have to constantly be asking God for wisdom. Um, you know, constantly asking him, Lord. Um, now, do you think that men shouldn't be constantly asking God for women for wisdom? No, I think this is this is for everybody. But I, I, you're asking me specifically for a woman, and this is from a woman's perspective. Okay. Um, and and I believe everyone has to do this. And thankfully, God says, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask, and it will not be denied to you. Thankfully, right? That God will freely give it to us. And so I think it's just a matter of, of learning when to lead and learning when to step back, um, learning when to serve and learning when to, to rise up. And so it's, it's a, a gentle balance, but also uh, very important uh, to, 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 to know your role and to know your identity in Christ. What would you say to your younger self to encourage her as she considers ministry or takes first steps in a ministry? You will understand. Later, you will understand. You know, there is a scripture that says that right now you don't understand, but later you'll understand. You know, there's some things um, that happen that you really don't understand. And um, those are going to be you know, moments that God is going to remind you later on. This is what I was trying to share with you. This is what I was trying to teach you. This is what I was trying to grow you in, you know, in your character, in your demeanor. Um, and I, I want to tell my younger person, you know, be strong and courageous. You know, I want to tell my younger person is don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, you know, because there is a reason why that's in the Bible, because it happens. <laughs> There's always going to be somebody more uh, wiser than you, uh, much more educated than you, much more gifted than you even, all right? But still, God has chosen you. So be strong and courageous, because God is with you. And that's your assignment. So find yeah. out what your assignment is, and be faithful. And be strong and courageous, because God is with you. I like that. And and God never answers the why question, but you just have to realize, well, God put me here. <laughs> there must yeah. be an answer there somewhere. I'm the one that's here. So I'm the one that has to solve the problem. Okay. Have faith. God knew what he was doing when he put you there. Now, we all have different parts of our personalities. So even though it's difficult to separate out those parts, how would you share how you think your sexuality your race, your class, or other aspects of your identity have impacted your abilities in ministry? You know, I do recognize that myself as a woman and as a Latina, you know, I am underrepresented. Uh, I, I look at the statistics and, you know, we're talking, you know, nationally, we're, we're, we're talking, you know, we're, we're, we're a very minority group. Okay, uh, local pastors, 
and also ordained elders and also bishops. We only have two Latina bishops in our denomination. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 we see very few Hispanic women in leadership, you know, as district superintendents, as directors. Um, and so what it's, it's, it, what I'm mindful of is why, why is that? If 85% or 60, 60 to 85% of our neighborhood is Hispanic, why is there not sufficient representation and leadership, you know, to be able to address some of these questions? And I believe um, there hasn't been enough um, people that are already serving as leaders to be able to fully make an impact. Um, what can other colleagues, including men, do to be better allies and support of women in ministry? I would invite you, male co colleagues, to uh, step out of your comfort zone. And, and if you see something or if, if you get a nudge from God, you know, uh, do it. You know, it, and that, that includes, you know, blessing us, praying over us, being a, a lending ear. Um, I, I can't tell you how many um, male pastors that I wouldn't be here without you. You know, I wouldn't be here without your prayers. I wouldn't be able to be here without your uh, words of wisdom and even words of, of correction. Okay. I welcome that because I know if it comes from a place of love, if it comes from a place of wanting the best for me, um, I'll receive it, you know, um, and words of, uh, you, you don't know how important you are in our lives. You don't know how important um, your prayers are, you know, uh, just, just uh, this morning, I had uh, my spiritual dad, you know, Reverend Bill Hitt, he's a retired uh, Methodist pastor. He, uh, he texts me and he, and he said, you know, I'm praying for you. You know, I'm praying for you. I love you. I'm praying for you. And just to get that kind of note, uh, you know, from a male white clergy, you know, really meant the world to me, you know, and, um, and if, if God is, is, is putting someone around you, a young Timothy, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to challenge you. Who are you personally discipling? Who are you personally mentoring? And if you're not, if you're not discipling, you know, Jesus had 12. Maybe you can't do 12, but maybe you could do three. You know, Jesus has his inner circle. You know, those moments where it was not for everybody, he would just call his inner three. So what I challenge all of us, and including myself, is to always asking the Lord, Lord, who are, who, who are ones that I can um, speak um, into who, who are the ones that I can speak into their lives to encourage them, to mentor them, to coach them, to help them, because we can all learn from each other. We truly can. And so I, I just, I just, I just welcome that. And I, I believe that we need to recreate that, bring that up again. We need each other. We can't do this without you. Okay. Good words. You'd be surprised. All the other women said the same thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> So then it's a definitely a need and a want. Well, Emma, it has been a delight to talk with you. Thank you for being so forthcoming and so um, full well, of information you. and sharing. Thank you for being a coach to me because see, Pastor Steve, I, 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 we need, we, I need you. Like you had, thank you for helping me walk through this because I know I was nervous and, and, and you just, you just sense the pressure, you know, that thank you uh, for um, your encouragement for your words of wisdom and and for blessing me um you know in my own personal life thank you you're, I honor you're, you're very welcome i believe in you and i think you're doing good work thank you pastor that, that means a lot to me coming from you god bless you all right well, i hope you enjoyed our conversation with emma vega if you have questions or comments or suggestions for future videos please send them to me at steve at revstevep.com please consider clicking the subscribe button below or my smiling face to the right side. Next week, we will talk about what to do after Easter and planning for the summer. See you next week on Coffee with Coach.